five minutes. Mm -hmm. I can give you ten if you want. Do you want ten? Um, no, <laughs> So welcome back, everyone. To start with, we have Elizabeth Krauser uh, starting off this afternoon's session. Thank you for coming back from lunch. Okay. Thank you for coming back from lunch on time, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's actually a great opportunity for me to learn about Euclid, which is also why I've allowed myself to extend the uh, conference title slightly to Euclid++. Um, I will talk about large phase structure cosmology in the systematic limited regime particularly bringing my perspective from L16W first. But I think the story is quite similar for Euclid, and I'd be happy to learn more about how, the dif um, how it uh, differs in particular later on. So, um, outlook, or upshot of my talk. Let's start a cosmology talk, as always, with a pie chart. This is my optimistic view of um, cosmology analysis in about 2025. And um, if we do our homework right, then um, hopefully we will have about 5% of our parameters that are cosmology parameters. And the remaining 95% will be systematics. These come in the form of known unknowns, things like galaxy bias that we know exist already, and we just need to self-calibrate uh, their values from the data, and unknown unknowns that will come as surprises as we open, open up the actual data. And in this talk, I'll give you an overview of how we prepare for that and get ready to make sense of unknown unknowns. So I think uh, some people have talked about this before, but just to be clear, um, at least in large case structure right now, I would say we're in an intermediate area, era learning phase. We have a bunch of measurements. They scatter around. And if we keep doing the same and just get a bigger survey, we might end up in a bias situation. So just precision in terms of statistical power is not enough. What we actually need uh, is a precise and accurate cosmology and that comes as, at the cost of uh, much more complex analyses. Um, brief overview of the, of the landscape of uh, photometric dark energy surveys. Right now we are here in this learning phase after initial um, discovery phase. People are trying out cosmic shear uh, on CFHLS, Cosmos, and DLS. Right now our kids, DS and HSC are consolidating those lessons and we're getting ready to deal with billions of galaxies coming to our hard drives in the mid-2020s. And um, yeah, I will talk through what we're learning right now in the dark energy survey and how that may apply or at least inform us uh, for uh, the mid-2020s. So we will have these uh, wonderful wide field imaging surveys and we want to get the best cosmology out of it as possible. And in general we know that that comes from combining probes, as you all know in the famous plots, uh, combining supernovae, CMB and BO, which is beautiful because anyone can take the individual likelihoods, download them, multiply them and get a joint constraint since uh, these uh, probes are almost uncorrelated and fairly consistent at the moment, that's easy to do. However, when we talk about combining large scale structure probes from the same survey, the situation gets more difficult because clustering and weak lensing and galaxy clusters all probe the same underlying density field at similar redshifts. So they are intrinsically co correlated. They're also astrophysically correlated. And these are observations from the same data, so there will be shared uh, observation effects meaning that we have to um, directly do a full joint analysis instead of multiplying posteriors. So just briefly, each of these boxes, of course, uh, is work of many, many people, and I can't do them justice in, in one short um, overview talk. Let's just say at the end, we want to um, constrain our um, parameters. Of course, the qu first question is which parameters and which data can we model accurately for that? So that's the first choice in huge debate then we will have some priors from external experiments. We will need a likelihood function, which you already heard about this morning, that is a huge challenge for stage four surveys. Um, I'll just assume it's Gaussian slash Poisson, depending on whether I use um, two-point statistics or cluster counts uh, to in, in, in these forecasts. Uh, but uh, that's, of course, a major er era of, uh, area of improvement. Then we need a model for our data vector, both in terms of the cosmology and all the nuisance parameters. That is the systematics, which will be 90% of this talk. We will need a joint covariance. Another huge challenge uh, for upcoming surveys, especially when we think about uh, combining the very large scale probes with galaxy clusters. Uh, that basically um, sets impossible simulation requirements. Obviously, an um, area that needs much work in the future. In this talk, um, all forecasts are based uh, on perturbation theory and halo model uh, covariances, but including the non Gaussian terms. 
And then the big unknown, the nuisance parameters, the one thing that is clear is that they will far outnumber our cosmology parameters. And now we need to somehow make progress in this parameter space and figure out where to spend our efforts. And I would just like to stress that no facial matrices were harmed for this talk. All the co contours you see here are actual MCMC forecast in high dimensional parameter spaces because that's um, a good step towards building uh, functional analysis pipelines and really understanding your parameter spaces. So uh, the game is systematics. Uh, a few years ago, before we had data, uh, we did um, a poll of the DES working groups and asked uh, what each working group was worried about. The candidate uh, systematics are probably not surprising. Uh, people worry about galaxy bias, came up with uh, extensive fortizations of that. Uh, we worry about the cluster mass observer relation, about shear calibration, photosies, and so on. No big surprise there. But the number of parameters that we came up with was of order 500 to 1,000. Yeah. Uh, marginalizing all of that would take forever and might also remove uh, some constraining power that we don't need to uh, marginalize out. Uh, so we uh, needed to uh, make progress over this. And uh, my one example from current data for that today is uh, DES year one analysis. So that's uh, 1,500 square degrees uh, from DES that came out almost two years ago now. And uh, for that analysis, we combine about 600,000 uh, red sequence galaxies, red magic, which gives us excellent uh, photosies in five tomography bins, and 26 million uh, source galaxies for the weak lensing, split in four tomography bins. And then we look at the auto and cross correlations of galaxy positions, so clustering, and galaxy shapes, cosmic shear, and galaxy galaxy lensing, and pipe that through to cosmology. On the systematic side, uh, we uh, became less ambitious than 500,000 uh, parameters. First of all, we don't include cl galaxy clusters. Th at the moment, that already reduces the parameter space quite a bit. Um, but still, we would have had more than 200 uh, parameters on our original parameterization. And then we settled on using linear bias per redshift bin, uh, shift parameters for uh, photosies in each lens and source uh, tomography bin, um, multiplicative shear calibration per redshift bin again, and different param parametric uh, models for intrinsic alignments. Of course, this list of systematics is known to be incomplete. There are known unaccounted for systematics that could potentially bias our analysis. So we ran a bunch of simulated analyses to check how much baryons or higher order galaxy biasing would um, bias uh, our cosmology results. And then accordingly, we devised scale cuts so that these known but unaccounted for systematics um, do not uh, screw up our cosmology. That means that our um, signal to noise is already severely systematics limited. We throw out most of the high signal to noise small scale data points in order to be able to get, get away with the simple model. And then of course, uh, these are very simplified translations and that it's not supposed to be some um, universal truth about the actual physics of, the, of um, galaxies. Uh, so we also had to test that these parameterizations are su sufficiently flexible for our year one analysis. Of course, all these are statements with respect to our year one error bars. As we are now analyzing three times as much data, the requirements are much more stringent and all of this needs to be updated. Uh, just to show um, how it worked with these 20 uh, systematics parameters, uh, we got uh, these cosmology contours, green cosmic shear alone, marginalized over um, weak lensing nuisance parameters, uh, red galaxy clustering and galaxy galaxy lensing, marginalized over the same nuisance parameters plus um, um, galaxy bias and uh, uh, redshift um, uncertainty parameters for the lens sample. And uh, hopefully you can be convinced already by eye that these are two very consistent uh, analyses, uh, so we can combine them. We of course also checked in the full 26 dimension parameter space. Uh, that the posteriors of the two um, parts uh, agree. And then we arrive at these blue contours, with, which is our DSE1 combined analysis. Um, so much just uh, for systematics and practice. Of course, um, you've seen these contours before, the comparison between DS combined in the blue versus Planck. Planck uh, contours might look distorted because we always marginalize over neutrino mass. Uh, it is more than one sigma shift in central value towards uh, low omega meta S8, as also seen by other weak lensing um, analyses. I would say whether this is attention or not um, is something that we will decide in the next few years, hopefully. The jury is out. Um, in, in this projection, it does not look like a severe tension yet. It's um, less than two sigma. And uh, there's uh, ongoing debate on how to quantify this in the full parameter space. But I think it's clear that we need more galaxies. 
And that uh, brings me to um, our preparations for WFIRST and LSST, two surveys uh, with very different service strategies. WFIRST, I will uh, focus on the um, high latitude uh, survey imaging of about 2,000 square degrees to very high depths, about 50 galaxies per square arc minute, versus LSST, 18,000 uh, or 20,000 square degrees with uh, something of order 30 galaxies per square arc minute. So let's talk about survey optimization. In the past, uh, we may have ma made a plot like this, saying more galaxies uh, is better. Then once you start varying galaxy density and, er and area, it becomes a bit more complicated, uh, where forecasts consistently find that once you pass a certain uh, galaxy density threshold, um, more area brings gains more quickly than adding depth. So it becomes a, more, a slightly more complicated uh, optimization problem where, of course, having more area and more number density of galaxies would be optimal. And then you find a compromise depending on your cervix, on your particular science case. However, uh, for systematics limited surveys, um, survey optimization looks more like this, where all the systematics come into play and it becomes a very complicated and time consuming pr problem. I don't think anyone has really mapped out uh, this parameter space completely. One statement we can make, though, is that all of them are expensive. <laughs> so let's try to um, uh, optimize our efforts. Um, to start us off with, uh, again, on topic of systematics, here are some optimistic um, forecasts uh, about a three by two point an analysis with W first and LSST. So again, cosmic shear, galaxy galaxy and galaxy clustering, where we uh, made very optimistic assumptions about uh, photometric redshift and shear calibration. And these contours then show you the difference between um, um, a forecast that is uh, cosmic variance only, no, no systematics. So galaxy bias is fixed, most importantly. And then the um, red arrows show what happens once we free up galaxy bias, lens photo Z, source photo Z, and shear calibration, photography, retro, photography bin. Most of this uh, loss in constraining power is actually from linear galaxy bias. Uh, we do have a rather optimistic um, priors on the observation systematics in this case. So these um, analyses will be systematics limited, even if we restrict uh, to linear bias. And with that, uh, throw out a lot of data points with most signal to noise, uh, because we say this, just give up on the systematics. If we then um, become even more ambitious and uh, throw in all the different uh, static probes from LSST, that is uh, clustering shown in, in yellow here, cosmic shear in red, galaxy cluster number counts, generally marginalized over the mass of the relation, we end up with these three rather broad contours, and then the green and the black show you how much uh, self-calibration of these underlying systematics really helps um, to uh, capture the full constraining power of LSST. In this case, that's marginalizing over almost 50 nuisance parameters, which is only first step towards the giant parameter spaces we will have to face um, in a few years from now. So let's get to work. We might ask, what's the dominant known systematic for LSST or the first multiprobe analysis? But uh, there is no one-fits-all answer. We need to be much more specific. However, it's clear, since we're doing cosmology with galaxies, the answer will likely involve galaxy evolution in some shape or form. So we have to start out by specifying the data vector um, or the analysis that we want to run once we have data. And then we can again write our laundry list of uh, possible systematic effects. And um, as the next step, we have to write down consistent parameterizations of these effects across all probes. And then we can um, go through an exercise that I will outline in the next few slides to figure out which of those matter most and for which we should get uh, information from external data sets. So right now we are in a situation where we don't have data yet, but we do have theory, theory simulations and we're building analysis codes and we're preparing for parameter constraints that we want to be precise, small error bars and, error, and accurate right on target. So right now we take each systematic effect at a, t at a time, forecast its impact, and then refine as needed. So in a cartoon, this would be um, a theory stream. We get a data set, analyze it, and somehow we know the underlying cosmology, recover it with small error bars. Everything is perfect. If then there was an underlying systematic that we ignored, we do the same analysis in cure parameter bias. Since we know we forgot something, we put it in, we marginalize, and uh, we remove the parameter bias but uh, at a cost of increased parameter uncertainty. 
if this is a big effect, then we can decide, okay, now is, th is the time to actually get to work and be creative. So we can go out and uh, figure out how to better constrain the systematics with exter external data. For example, if it's variant feedback, we can go and look at KSD observations or similar and put type, type priors on which of the um, variant scenarios that we marginalized over are actually allowed in nature. At that point, we would recover some of the information we had just lost, and then we go on um, to our next systematic uh, and always focus on the ones with um, the largest uh, potential loss of constraining power. One example uh, of a particular gain is um, galaxy bias. Of course, galaxies are much more messy than the primary CMB, uh, so uh, this is um, a complicated endeavor involving all of astrophysics, similar to foregrounds. Um, here is a, on the right is a forecast how well you we could co constrain the equation of state with L T, combining lensing and clustering if we only use a linear galaxy bias, so restricting to fairly large scales. And then I wanted you to focus on the improvement from these outer contours to the inner green ones um, that we could uh, gain if we uh, managed to accurately um, capture the information from small scales, which in this case involved perturbative bias and um, HOD uh, for, the, for the one halo term clustering, and then marginalizing over all these additional parameters. So I think that forecast uh, marginalized over something like 90 parameters. And clearly this would be an enormous gain. Uh, that's equivalent to doing um, linear bias only clustering on two full skies. And, as, as a, and I think that's much more futuristic than understanding small scale clustering. So um, this is definitely um, um, one part of astrophysics where we can learn a lot. However, these models are complicated. So realistically, we might end up in a situation like this, where we um, approximately uh, recover the true parameters with some penalty for marginalizing over additional systematics and a slight parameter bias. Then the next step uh, happens once we have data. Now we can look at each of our measurements at a time, uh, perform its analysis in isolation, and look for consistency between these different measurements. That will tell us whether we have a consistent model, uh, including all the cosmology and uh, astrophysics. Then we might end up in a situation like this, which is uh, where the fun begins. So um, then we might ask, do these contours shift together um, if we change uh, our scale cuts, if we exclude nonlinear scales? That would be a signal, a clear sign that uh, we missed some systematics in the nonlinear regime. Uh, we can check whether it depends on the galaxy um, or cluster selection, which uh, again uh, points to um, observation systematics or type dependent astrophysics. We can calibrate with more accurate measurements. That would be spectroscopic redshifts. Um, in the case of photosees, um, those get a cluster mass proxies for optical cluster cosmology, um, and galaxy sh shapes from space-based -based lensing uh, for weak lensing. Where on the right here, I show a comparison between uh, Subaru images, which is probably the closest ground-based um, observations we have right now to LSST, versus space-based imaging, and you can see that blending is a huge problem. Of course, all of these approaches are potentially very expensive, but I still want to show uh, one example here where we looked at the possible synergies between um, LSST and W first. This is a purely hypothetical use of W first, uh, where we considered um, a very wide field uh, survey in the W band, basically the photon bucket, extending from one to two microns, considering what we could do if we had LSST photosees, uh, but W first images for shape measurements. And there you can see um, uh, the limiting magnitude that can be reached with a W band uh, wide field survey as a function of survey time and you can reach about 95% completeness of an imaging of the LSST sample uh, after um, about five months. That would be a uh, space page uh, imaging quality LSST photosees uh, in an amazingly short time. On the right, we map that to the number of galaxies per square arc minute. And um, finally, we consider how much we would then gain over LSST three by two point analysis uh, by itself shown in green versus the um, standard uh, W-first um, high latitude survey of about 2,000 square degrees. <coughs> so that is W-first by itself, um, no synergies with LSST. And then in red, if we use W-first white as a shape machine uh, combined with LSST photosees. That's of course purely hypothetical. Um, the rest of W-first may likely has very other ideas how to use this uh, fantastic instrument and Olivier will talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, just one suggestion throw out there. 
Fortunately, we also have uh, other ways of uh, checking um, galaxy shapes, or in general, using cross correlations. So for that, we can use a different survey with different um, observation systematics and uh, check whether the um, predicted cross correlations uh, agree with the measurement and constrain uncorrelated systematics. So on the right here, I show a forecast for LCC shear calibration. How well that can be uh, constrained by cross calibrating um, galaxy lensing based um, shear measurements from LSST uh, with CMB lensing uh, from the CMBS4. So two completely uh, different uh, measurement techniques of the same effect. And um, the y-axis shows you the shear calibration um, bias uh, constraints as a function of uh, tomography bin or mean redshift. And the important point is that this, uh, that this cross correlation between galaxy shapes and CMB lensing can constrain shear calibration biases to better than the LSST requirement for high redshift galaxies where, of course, galaxies are the most irregularly shaped uh, fuzzy blobs where um, image simulation uh, might be most limited. So uh, those will be our tools to uh, figure out what the hell is going on. And as we uh, go through this um, process of understanding our unknown systematics, we should be mindful um, about how we prioritize. So the question is, would our approach change if we knew, for example, that the Planck best fit uh, was over there? And what would, would uh, tell us both about cosmology and cosmologists? So we might want to uh, put in blinding uh, in both the step of uh, finding consistency. And then once we have consistency, so once we have one model that can describe all the probes consistently, then we can combine. Uh, and that will get us to um, accurate cosmology. So uh, if we've done our homework well, then I hope my very optimistic uh, view of this pie chart could be that there will be 5% cosmology parameters, um, about 70% in known unknowns that we've characterized before, which means that we are ready to make quick work of those 25% previously unknown unknowns that we can only discover once we have data. Um, and that will then bring us to our best um, cosmology constraints, where throughout this process we have to use that all the systematics are usually observation systematics or astrophysical systematics, which means that they are survey and probe specific. And we can use that fact in cross correlation and through um, cross calibration to slice and dice this parameter space. And um, that's my outlook on um, systematics uh, for future surveys. I mean, we are entering this decade of very large galaxy surveys where it is clear that the um, cosmology constraints will be systematics limited one way or another, either through marginalization or because we just give up and say systematics are too complicated, we throw out all of these high signature noise data points. Um, looking at the different measurements from the same survey and from different surveys uh, will enable accurate cosmology constraints because we can identify and understand systematic effects. And once we've done though, so, maximize constraining power. However, this approach uh, requires that we start collaborating across collaborations now, across different surveys, across different wa wavelengths, across different, different techniques and already now plan for analysis frameworks that can eventually combine data from all surveys. And I know how difficult that can already be uh, across different working groups. Uh, so I'm glad that uh, I can talk to people from Euclid here. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Questions? <clears throat> so if you do this, then I think realistically you have to accept a risk that you might not get it to work. So, you know, you're, you're entering, you know, you're not guaranteed to be able to deal with all of these systematics. Some may kill you. Some systematic would always kill you. What, what would we be the alternative? Just give up? I mean, I'm just saying that there's, there's, a, you know, there's a risk of not being able to, you know, this, this isn't a, uh, <clears throat> you know, a well-defined methodology that is guaranteed to give you unbiased results. You may be, you know, just completely killed. But uh, I think we have to go through the same steps even in the most simplistic model where we say, okay, we only stick to linear scales. Um, so if we start with the uh, least ambitious analysis, I think then we're still on a good path. I would not uh, put all my bets uh, onto the highly nonlinear regime from the start. At some point, we will always say, this gets too complicated. Let's uh, default one step back. 
you know, this might be a slightly loaded question, but given DESI, LSST, and Euclid, what's the incremental value, do you think, of W first? It probes definitely out to very different depths. So uh, if there's a surprise at high redshift, then um, W first will be um, a good way to look for it. And uh, I, s I think still having um, the complementarity of two different space-based experiments will be very useful. And I think Olivier might have uh, more on that. Uh, Elizabeth, can you tell us more about blinding and how, how you use blinding to uh, uh, improve or uh, ensure consistency, as you were saying? Sorry, uh, just uh, a question. Ca can you comment a bit more about uh, blinding that you propose to uh, to make sure that you're uh, you're uh, improving uh, consistency and accuracy? So, um, in the first step, um, I think this it's very hard to blind at a catalog level because we don't know a transformation that would transform galaxy uh, shapes, cluster abundance, and uh, cluster galaxy positions uh, in a consistent way. So I think this will be some um, post-processing step in the data analysis. At least that makes it also relatively um, easy to implement. And it just allows us to uh, change these 95% of all parameters um, without knowing how it would um, shift the contours or where it would shift the contours given that 95% are in these astrophysical systematics, where uh, we might say, oh, I have this insight on the redshift, redshift evolution of a given effect. Uh, it's good to separate that um, understanding of systematics from its potential impact on the cosmology con contours. So uh, I think uh, that's where blinding comes in in that first step. And then I also think um, as we um, look through consistency between different probes, um, again, we should be guided by quantitative tests, not by our implicit assumption, oh, that particular um, value must be right. But, I mean, I, I'm asking the same question maybe in a slightly different way. Suppose that uh, when you have your different probes still blinded, it's all over the place, mm -hmm. up to some level. Uh, so you, you will still do all the search completely blind, and what if this not converge? I mean, you know, you okay, you, 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 you throw away some information, and now you find something that is essentially inconsistent. So what's next? You publish as, as it is? I think oh, I, I mean, just, I'm just asking what is uh, the, the thinking at this time, because this is one of the difficulty is sometimes by unblinding, you, you may find that, you know, well, some of the systematic effects and in, in in a way that you know couldn't be seen once once this is blinded. So that's that, that's a specific question. Yeah. So there is no ofi official plan for this in LCT yet. We're just starting to discuss this at the moment, at least in DES. Uh, the idea is that uh, if we don't find consistency um, before unblinding, then we should go back and simplify our analysis until we uh, get consistency, <coughs> even if it comes at a loss of constraining power. And. Um, if we, uh, if we happen to unblind and realize it's rubbish, then we have to change state any uh, changes that were done post unblinding in the paper so that others can hopefully uh, judge for themselves whether those choices we made post unblinding uh, are justified or just driven by confirmation bias. Okay, last question. So I, <coughs> I got from one of your last plots that you divided the, the uh, systematics into known unknowns and, and some remaining unknown unknowns. Obviously the unknown unknowns, we don't know what they are. But I think there's a third category, isn't there, that of, of known unknowns that we really don't know how to deal with very well. And like, say, intrinsic alignments, we don't have very good models for photometric redshifts is a difficult problem. I wondered which of those problems have kept you awake at night most. Photosies. I think for intrinsic alignments on most of the scales that we'll use, uh, the perturbative models will get good enough. Okay, let's thank Elizabeth again.
Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So um, first, thank you to the organizers for allowing me to present this work. And this is um, mainly the results of some studies of the kids gamma collaboration that investigates the role of satellites in the intrinsic alignment and what does this mean for the uh, for Combs shear uh, analysis and in particular I want to uh, highlight here the names of Harry Johnson from Museum and Chris Oyerio from Leiden University which did also part of this work so we all know from also the other talks that weak lensing is a very powerful tool to probe cosmological parameters uh, but uh, it's subject to a number of systematics and one of these is intrinsic alignment. So because lensing um, correlates shapes uh, and infer the cosmological parameters through the distortion of these shapes, if the galaxy from the background already have an intrinsic orientation, then your cosmological parameters will be biased. And this is indeed the case. Galaxies have an intrinsic orientation because they form inside uh, dark matter halos and they are subject to the tidal fields of the matter surrounding them. And this uh, feature it's, uh, generates two main observable, which are the intrinsic-intrinsic alignment, uh, which is the tendency of a closed pair of galaxies to point in the same direction because they feel the same uh, tidal field, and the gravitational intrinsic correlations so the correlation of a galaxy, which is intrinsically sheared by a matter over density, but the same matter over density at the same time is also uh, aligned tangentially a galaxy from the background, which is illustrated in the cartoon on the background. Um, so what do we know right in terms of intrinsic alignment? We have, some, uh, we have a, a sort of good picture which mainly uh, characterize the intrinsic alignment in terms of uh, two main uh, sample of galaxies. We have a mechanism that characterizes the red elliptical galaxy that being uh, pressure supported, uh, tend to adjust the orbits of the stars to the uh, potential that they feel. And this is well described by the linear alignment model. And then we have these blue galaxies which being rotationally supported, they tend to align the spin and this mechanism is quadratic in the matter density construct, and this gives, uh, so far has given no uh, detection uh, in terms of observation. So we have no amplitude, like we have a zero amplitude for the alignment of blue galaxies, uh, while we have a positive and significant alignment for elliptical galaxies. So for the rest of the talk, I will mainly refer to the linear alignment model as a reference model. Uh, which, in, as I just said, describe the alignment of elliptical galaxies. So, because we want to uh, marginalize over intrinsic alignment in our cosmic shear analysis, we also don't want to burden the contours too much, and so we need the most uh, informative prior possible from observation. And, and there have been lots of works so far in literature investigating intrinsic alignment on different samples. I'm, I'm going to present uh, just a few of them, which will uh, help the rest of the talk. But one of the uh, most broad ones was done in 2011 from Joachini, which uh, combined a number of samples from the CSS and investigated uh, a redshift dependence and luminosity dependence of the intrinsic alignment signal for LRGs. And what I found was that there was no significant uh, redshift dependence in the data. Uh, while there was a significant luminosity uh, scaling, we could be well described by power law with low beta, which is indicated with the uh, blue line in the, in the plot. Uh, a similar result was found later on on low Z galaxies by Singh in 2015, which is shown here with the uh, red line with similar amplitude and similar uh, Slope. So, one of the limitations of intrinsic alignment uh, studies is that to maximize the signal to noise, to noise uh, they typically focus on subsample of galaxies which are not representative of cosmic shear analysis. And so, with the KITS Gamma uh, collaboration, we try to provide priors that were uh, obtained for, from a sample of galaxy which is closer to the one of cosmic shears. Uh, so we, we use indeed the overlapping region between kids and gamma. Kids we have seen already is as a very good images and is designed to provide accurate shapes for, for your galaxies uh, through a great control of the PSF, for example. 
Um, and the gamma is, is a very a highly complete uh, spectroscopic uh, sample. So it's really suitable for intrinsic element studies. We combine both gamma and the DSS main galaxy in the study, and we could confirm that blue galaxies have no alignment, at least in our sample, and, and we found a significant alignment for the red sample instead. Uh, and here you have to look just at the uh, large scales of, of the plot. So we fit only for um, a transverse separation larger than six megaparsec. And the estimators, we, the um, uh, function that we are, I'm plotting here is the um, projected correlation function. Now, interesting, we didn't find any luminosity dependence in this data, in concert with the previous result that I've just shown you. But we also asked ourselves, can we do something more with this data? So one of the main things that I just mentioned before is that we know that intrinsic elements strongly depend on morphology, so we have a clear dichotomy between red and blue galaxies. Uh, so we ask ourselves, is, is that the only physical properties that drives intrinsic alignment? So can we fully describe intrinsic alignment just in terms of this quantity? So we uh, look at the amplitude of the intrinsic alignment. Uh, and if, if it's in, indeed the main uh, physical uh, information there, then we can just use a linear combination of the amplitude from the red sample and the amplitude of the blue sample uh, times the uh, fraction uh, of, of red galaxy that you have there to find out the full uh, amplitude of your sample. Uh, we did so, and the total amplitude is the uh, yellow point, and we can clearly see that it doesn't lie on top of this interpolation. While the SDSS sample is exactly on top, and the gamma one is really below, is the one that uh, is driving also the total down. So what's the difference between SDSS and gamma? Because SDSS is shallower, uh, it's deficient of uh, satellites at low redshift. And so here we go. Satellites really complicate the picture. It's not just a matter of red and blue. We try to investigate this further, studying the uh, correlation between centrals and satellites separately. So once we use the centrals as a, a position, tracer and uh, the satellites as shapes, and so on for all of the possible for combination. And here we can see that uh, on, the, on the two panels on, on, the, on the right, we, have, uh, we can see that satellites, uh, where they are contributing with the, with the shapes, are really suppressing the signal at large scales. So they, they do not align at large scales. Uh, and the central, uh, the red centers are basically those that brings all of the signal at large scales, which is then just dumped by the presence of blue and satellites. So, as I just said, satellites wash out the signal. This is the takeaway message of this study. What does it imply for cosmic shear analysis? Now, we know that uh, cosmic shear uh, are flux limited, so cosmic shear analysis use flux-limited sample, and so uh, there is an implicit selection of galaxy uh, in each tomographic beam, just due to the flux limit. So high redshift beams are populated by brighter galaxies than the lower redshift ones, uh, are at least the fraction is higher. And, and so this impacts the fraction of satellites that you will have there. Um, we try to investigate what does it mean for a, uh, a kids-like uh, survey, and we use my simulation to produce mocks that simulates uh, indeed uh, kids. And here we look at the different contribution of uh, each sample. So assuming a reference amplitude of one for your intrinsic alignment, how much each population uh, change modulates the amplitude in the, along the redshift beams um, just because of this implicit selection due to the flux limit. So if we look at the dotted lines, we see the contribution of satellites which suppress the signal at low redshift where they are more abundant, and then the signal slightly recover uh, through one uh, while we go to higher redshift where the uh, sample is, po is mainly populated by uh, centrals. Then we have the red fraction, which is the one that is always accounted in intrinsic element studies, and which with the typical bell, which dumb down the signal even more, and then what we expect to be actually the final signal is just due to the uh, fraction of red central galaxies. And so it's just the solid line, which is, as we can see, much lower than just the fraction of red, satellite, of red galaxy there, 
Uh, and it's also uh, has a weaker dependence on redshift than, than considering only red without this further suppression of satellites. We've also seen that there is this tension between uh, previous measurements on LRG's uh, galaxies and, and, the, and the one in gamma. What does it mean in this context? So assuming again that uh, only the red centers brings the signal, uh, and so we integrate the luminosity uh, only of, of this sample, uh, what does it mean for, for our cosmic shear uh, case analysis? Um, even in the case of no luminosity dependence at all, which is the blue line, we can see the modulation due to the uh, varying fraction of red centrals, as discussed before. And for the case of uh, Lozi and Mega Z, which are the uh, two highest lines, uh, we can see that in particular, like, at the intermediate redshift, where we have the peak of the uh, red central fraction, the curve steepens and there is a slightly plateau. Now, this definitely needs to be investigated more in data, so we need to address the luminosity dependence better, and this is what we are doing now also on kids 1000 LRG sample, uh, and also try to figure out whether there's like some second dependence due to colors, for example, so a different uh, cut in, 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 the, in, the red, uh, in the color magnitude space might lead to a different dependence. Okay, I've talked extensively of the, on the alignment uh, uh, of satellites at large scales. Let's look at the, uh, what does it mean for small scales. We investigate that in the group uh, catalog from the gamma collaborations, and we try to constrain the tendency of, of satellite aligned, of satellite galaxy to align on the direction of the uh, brightest central galaxy of the group. So what we found is that Satellites indeed show an alignment at very uh, small separation from the BGG, and then this alignment just goes down as we move uh, farther away uh, in, inside the, the group. And, and the signal is much stronger for red satellites than blue ones. Interestingly, we didn't find uh, any luminosity dependence, and not uh, dependence on the mass of the uh, group. Uh, w this is, was quite surprising, but we, we couldn't really find any significant trend there. Uh, another interesting thing that we explore is whether there's a uh, dependence on the alignment uh, on the galaxy scale, so on which part of the galaxy we are actually probing. So here, uh, using different uh, weight function while measuring the shapes, uh, we could probe uh, either more the inner part of the galaxy, so the bulge, or the outer part, and, and we found out that the outer regions, uh, the outer isotope, isotopes, are more aligned than, than the inner part, which is in agreement with the picture of tidal uh, threat and, and on, on the satellites. And, and this is also interesting because different shape algorithms can be used uh, to measure, indeed, intrinsic alignment. And, and they might lead to a different amplitude of your signal. Um, and so this also poses an important question when we want to do a consistent analysis. Okay, just to go to my conclusions, uh, we found that satellite galaxies play an important role uh, on, on the overall intrinsic alignment signal. They suppress the signal at large scales and they show an alignment uh, at very small scales, very close to the brightest galaxy of the group. Uh, this might impact uh, future uh, analysis uh, for forecast for like Euclid, where we have to really deal with the small scales. Uh, we are current, currently uh, analyzing the impact for a kids like uh, survey, and, uh, and we, will, we are planning to do the same for Euclid uh, after. And one of the also relevant uh, questions that remains open is whether there is or not a luminosity dependence and this has to be addressed in future works. Thanks. Thanks very much. Questions? So on the central satellite, uh, satellite uh, central alignment parts, I wonder to what extent 
do you need to worry about the possible uh, light extension from the central that has an ingredient imposed on the satellites that sits on the around yes. them? You have to, to deal with that. We, we did uh, using a specific image simulation where we account for the straight light of the BCG and, and then we, did, we subtract that uh, in our measurements and indeed uh, we found out that we cannot trust because the correction is too big, uh, the first bin where, where the uh, contamination is too strong. And, and the tendency of, the, of this contamination is indeed to uh, push the element up. So. Um, quick question, like you, you mentioned that observation suggests this satellite galaxy basically suppresses intrinsic alignment signal, but do we know the theory, if there are any suggestions in theory that For the satellites? That? Yes. The um, second question, if There you don't is mind. no really analytical model for that. We have, um, the only study that really looked at satellite alignment was in simulation from Pereira, uh, and it's also quite up updated, but I think it's still a very good description. So the picture from there is that the satellites are continuous torque uh, by the inner um, fields uh, inside the halo, so the satellite fields inside the halo. And, and the only model that we have at the moment for describing this most case is the halo model, which is based on, on this picture. Thank you. Any more? Okay, let's thanks Marie again. Next speaker is Will Coulton. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to present the work that my collaborators and I have been doing. I'm going to be talking about um, how we've been looking at how non Gaussian statistics can be used to constrain uh, neutrino mass in weak lensing convergence maps. So, as a very brief overview for everyone, as I'm sure you know from neutrino oscillation experiments, we've been able to measure the difference between the mass squared, between the the squares of the mass eigenstates for the three different uh, neutrino mass eigenstates. And this has led us to this picture that we have here, where we could ha have either one heavy uh, neutrino mass eigenstate or two. But because we've been measuring the differences, we don't actually know the overall offset. And this means that we don't know what the sum of the, the, sum of the masses of the neutrinos are, which is the, which is the property that's going to be important uh, for cosmology. In particular, um, from these mass differences, we know that there are two possible minimum masses. If we're in this normal hierarchy, the minimum mass of the sum should be around 60 MeV, whereas if we're in the inverted regime, it should be around 100 MeV. So these are the sort of constraining power we're going to need from future experiments if we're going to want to make a definitive detection of neutrino mass and we live in this uh, minimal mass situation. So we've already heard a, a few talks about how we can constrain the properties of neutrinos from cosmology particularly from the CMB or BBN, uh, but I'm going to be focusing on how we can constrain them, their mass from large-scale structure. And the feature that most matters here is the fact that uh, neutrinos free stream on small scales, but because uh, massive neutrinos contribute to the energy density, this means that they suppress structure on small scales. So as I'm sure you're very familiar with this plot of how neutrinos suppress structure on small scales uh, in the power spectrum, here showing three different masses. And this is the kind of effect we're hoping to uh, explore with higher order statistics. So uh, measuring the sum of the masses of the neutrinos is actually going to be challenging. Um, here is some forecasts done by SID last year showing how well you can expect to constrain the sum of the masses of the neutrinos using a combination of different experiments, in this case a CMBS4-like experiment combined with DESI and LSST. And in particular, it can be quite challenging to reach a very definitive detection of the sum of the neutrino masses if it's at this minimum value particularly if you uh, allow other cosmological parameters like the dark energy equation of state to vary. And so this motivated us to start considering, um, to start considering uh, higher order statistics because these previous constraints are, uh, have all been based only on two-point function measurements. And so I don't think I really need to introduce too much why we need to go into higher order statistics as we've already heard about that earlier, but just looking at this cartoon picture where they have both of these images have the same power spectrum. You can see by eye that there's a lot more information in this, uh, in this picture, which isn't captured by the two-point statistic. 
So the hope is by exploiting some of this non-Gaussian information, we can tighten our constraints on parameters like the some of the neutrino mass. So there's a very quick outline of the approach that we've been taking. Uh, it's been making use of lots of the uh, techniques we've heard earlier this morning. In particular, what we did is we chose a set of cosmological parameters, and we simulated these using n-body simulation. Then we generated a set of weak lens and convergence maps on which we can measure uh, the different statistics that you're interested in, so either the power spectrum, the bispectrum, or mostly what I'm going to focus on this talk is extreme accounts. Using, all, using measurements of these at, diff, at different cosmological parameters, we can then build uh, an emulator, and combining this with a likelihood means that you can evaluate uh, your constraining power of these different statistics. So the simulations we've been using are these, uh, a set of massive new simulations that have been run by Gia and her collaboration. They're n-body simulations where the neutrinos are implemented using the technique uh, developed by Yassine, and, uh, by Yassine uh, which involves them not as particles but using the Boltzmann equation. Um, and so we ran these simulations at 101 different cosmologies varying these three parameters, omega m, as, and the sum of the neutrino masses using a, a Latin hypercube-like setup to uh, choose the locations of the simulations we should run. So from these simulations, we then imagined a very idealized LSST-like setup where we have five source redshift planes, delta functions in this case, at redshifts 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, and 2.5. And then we've ray traced through our simulations using the multiplane lensing technique to generate large sets of, of convergence maps. And to these, we then add noise that's roughly equivalent to the kind of noise you could expect from an LST, LSST-like setup. Once we've done that, we can then start looking at different non-Gaussian statistics. I'm going to focus on extreme accounts. So going back to this cartoon image, one of the things that jumped out to the eye was the fact that you have very collapsed and very underdense structures in this non-Gaussian simulation that you didn't have in the Gaussian case. And so hopefully by measuring their properties, we can learn some, something new. So in particular, we've been looking at peak and minimum accounts, uh, and this is a very simple technique where you just look at the extreme points in your map, and you count them as a function of threshold, in this case normalized by the noise level in this map. And here are what two example distributions for this would look like on maps that have uh, no noise. And what you see is these high tails that stretch up, in this case for the peak counts, and these highly positive values are typically values peaks that arise from a single massive object along your line of sight, whereas these uh, peaks that arise in this area typically arise when you have uh, multiple, multiple groups along the line of sight. Similarly, you can have a similar situation for minima, where if you have an extremely underdense region, this happens to be a line of sight that uh, doesn't really cross any massive clusters, and a similar situation uh, in the slightly uh, underdense regions. So what is the effect of neutrinos on these extreme accounts? Sort of as you would expect. Here, if you look at the very high tail, you see a suppression. This is the ratio of the number counts in a, in a universe where you have 100 MeV neutrinos and versus uh, massless neutrinos. You see a suppression in the very large number of halos. This sort of makes sense from the argument that neutrinos suppress growth, so there's uh, fewer very, very uh, collapsed objects. And you see an increase in the number of uh, a uh, slight excess here, which means there's more, uh, more or less massive uh, clusters along your line of sight. Similarly, you see a similar story in the minima, where you see a suppression of the very large voids and a slight boost to uh, slightly under dense re uh, lines of sight. Um, so once you've measured these statistics at all of your different cosmologies that we simulated, you can then build an emulator. In this case, we've used a Gaussian process emulator to be able to interpolate what, your, what, it, what kind of peak counts you would get at a cosmology that we didn't observe. You can then combine this with a likelihood. In this case, uh, we've been using a Gaussian likelihood, but in ongoing work, we're exploring uh, how we can relax this assumption. And in the case of our Gaussian likelihood, we use a covariance matrix that we generated from a separate set of simulations. So how well can we constrain neutrino mass? If you look at this black line here, this is the kind of constraint that you could get from a power spectrum only analysis of these weak lensing maps. Then in red, you have the constraints that you would get from a minima, from minima, in blue, peaks, and in green, the combined constraints. So firstly, you can see that these non-Gaussian statistics allow you to significantly increase your constraining power on all of these statistics, or on all of these parameters, including some of them that have a slight different, slightly different degeneracy line from the power spectrum. So 
hopefully the takeaway from that is that there is a lot of non-Gaussian information in these higher order statistics. However, you've probably realized that I've said the word idealized many times already in this talk, and really that's what uh, lots of us in the community are turning our attention to now, is how we can uh, include the effects of more realistic simulations and systematics on these types of higher order statistics so they can become more widely used. So I think that's the biggest limiting factor. In particular, I'm going to present some preliminary work I've been doing investigating how uh, the effect of baryonic feedback can, imp can impact your constraints on peak counts and minima. In particular, to do this, we've been using the Bahamas simulations that have been run by Ian McCarthy and his collaborators. And these simulations have run uh, with the same initial conditions, four different types, a dark matter only simulation, and three different feedback levels. Um, they were actually on the graph we saw earlier in that mess of different feedback models. Um, and so these, the idea is here of these three different feedback strength models is that we can gauge uh, roughly what are the sort of extreme effect effects we'd expect on, on our statistics. At the moment, we only have one redshift for these, so we won't be using tomography as we'd had before, but instead, imagining all of our galaxies are in one redshift bin. So what I'm showing here is the fractional effect of our three different cosmological parameters. In blue, the neutrino mass. In orange, uh, your omega matter. And in green, your amplitude parameter. How they change your peak counts as a function of threshold. And then in red is the difference between the dark matter only simulation and the simulation that's tuned to have a level of feedback that roughly reproduces the level of gas we see in galaxy clusters and groups. So the first thing to notice is that this actually has quite a different shape uh, from the changes in the cosmological parameters, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so uh, we, then, we then use the three different uh, feedback type. We then use the three different feedback models we had here to construct a very simple model of how, how, how um, feedback affects the fractional um, to, to construct a model showing how uh, baryonic feedback changes the fractional level of, uh, of peak counts. And in work that Ian has been doing with his collaborators, they've been showing that this fractional effect is very insensitive, actually, to changes in cosmology. So you can use this fractional effect combined with the simulations we've had earlier to see how well, um, how, how, how baryons impact your parameter constraints and how well you could parameterize a baryonic model that's pr a very simple baryonic model like this. So this is some preliminary work that we've been doing here. In this crowded plot, these green lines are the contours that you saw before from our dark matter only model. This red contour here is what happens if you try to fit this dark matter only model to a data vector which includes the effects of baryons. And so you can see that you get uh, significantly biased contour constraints. And then in blue is, the fact is, is a model where we try to uh, parameterize the effect of baryons on, on our peak counts and try to fit for this as a parameter in our model. Again, this is a very simple one-parameter model family. But you can see that this doesn't, um, you can reobtain unbiased parameter constraints that aren't significantly broadened uh, by the effects of baryons. And so with that, I'd like to come to my conclusions. Uh, <laughs> spoke a little quicker than I thought. Um, hopefully, I've shown that with uh, some non-Gaussian statistics, we'll have significant additional constraining power that we can use to complement the the two-point statistic measurements we've been hearing a lot about today. However, there's still a lot to, of work to be done to go beyond the idealistic case to include the effects of systematics. And this is work that uh, we're doing and others in the community are looking at uh, very seriously to hopefully move these towards being something that you can use on data. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Right, thank you. Yeah, uh, I have a very uh, naive question. Is that uh, so? Your for extrema statistic that you are using, it's some some sort of skewness you are measuring in your distribution. Skewness you are measuring in your distribution, the tie tail and all. But I understand that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The skewness you are measuring in a high tail and all, in a way, it's a skew skewness you are measuring. Skewness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but somehow I, I had understanding that skewness is only uh, they're, they're sensitive to certain certain triangle configuration. That means you're not encompassing entire information of the higher order statistics, which you can in bispectrum. Yeah, so um, so 
So uh, I didn't have time to show this, but we've had a look at how, um, how well you can constrain the bispectrum, uh, how you can, well you can constrain these parameters using the bispectrum statistic. And you find that uh, peaks are, are very similarly competitive, so there's a similar amount of information there. <laughs> I think uh, this isn't uh, the skewness in the PDF, which might just be probing that. As you're, as you're probing extrema, you're also taking some information about the curvature of the field at that point as well. And so that might be giving you more information. Uh, so is it you're saying that you, these extrema counts, you it's somewhat, measure, uh, somewhat uh, measuring the morphology of the field? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, have you considered theoretically the connection between these peak counts to say weighted correlation function and weighted, you know, three-point function. When I say weighted, it means like people call it marked correlation function or marked statistics, right? Oh, where you, the clipped, sorry, no, no. No, like when you put a weight, you know, when you integrate, you actually oh, just sure. put a weight, say, you know, the environment dependence. This is a void, you want to weight it, you know, the more under dense this environment is, you weight it stronger, for example. Okay, no, I haven't uh, considered It'll be interesting to look, we can talk more when yeah, we go back. Yeah, no, that'll be interesting. Um, depending on the different feedback mechanisms that you implement, you can get quite big changes in the power spectrum yeah. at a high K. I mean, do you see similar kinds of discrepancies in the peak counts? Um, yes. Um. Yeah, so you, this red line uh, sort of tilts more or less uh, depending on the feedback uh, strength you have here. Um, and, and the range of models we have is only three simulations, so it's really not a complete picture of all the ways that feedback could influence here. This is something we'd like to explore with more simulations, of course. Um, well, the simulations cover quite an extreme range, so um, uh, I, think, I think they roughly characterize that. And, So you've looked at peak counts, um, we heard bispectrum, there's the PDF, um, yeah. the, the number of different statistics you could extract. Um, do you have any intuition as to which one or which combination of them or uh, every, uh, all of them? Uh, or should we maybe you know, ask a machine learning tool to pull out uh, the most informative statistic? Yeah, this is something we're working on now. I, th I think the conclusion is not going to be to use all of them. There's going to be clearly some balance of so it'd be nice to get an idea of how various different systematics affect these and, so, and also their information content. And so ideally you'd want some balance of all of these. And so some ongoing work as we're trying to compare how, how systematics like this and others affect these different, affect these different um, summary statistics as well as looking at things like the IMNN uh, to see how well uh, that can constrain and be affected by these. And so the idea will be in coming years we can have a good understanding of how systematics affect these and which one is the one we should really put a lot of our effort in to focus on. Okay, let's thank Will again. So we now have five short talks uh, in a row, continuing on the theme of massive neutrinos to start with. Shuvik Roy Chowdhury first. Yes. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm a PhD student at Harishchandra Research Institute, India. I, in this poster, I discuss the current constraints on neutrino masses from cosmological data. Neutrino masses are usually parameterized with some of neutrino masses with degenerate uh, approximation. Last year in June, in the above paper, as you can see, uh, 
we updated the bounds on some of neutrino masses using latest data publicly available, and we got a bound of around 0.124 EV from Planck, 2000, Planck 15 and a tau prior from Planck 2016 results and BAO. One month later, Planck 2018 results came out with a bound of similar bound with 0.12 EV. So, uh, as far as neutrino masses are concerned, uh, Planck 2000, uh, as long as uh, Planck 2018 likelihoods are not publicly available, the tau prior seems to work for neutrinos. So, uh, now new massive neutrinos are actually not uh, degenerate and Normal hierarchy has a minimum mass requirement of 0.6 AV, whereas it's 0.1 AV for inverted hierarchy. Thus, the current bounds are actually strong enough so that uh, this degenerate approximation is not really a very good approximation. So in this new work, we reanalyze assuming particular hierarchies and uh, as you can see that the bounds across different uh, uh, Hierarchies actually changes quite a lot with the uh, data, and we use uh, uh, the updated tau prior here, and also the Planck 18 lensing. And uh, as you can see, that the best fit value for, uh, I mean, the normal hierarchy is slightly preferred from the chi-square values. But uh, this is not all. Please come to my poster for additional analysis from other cosmological models and using uh, even more data. And thank you. And please ask any questions. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Thank you for the organizer for allowing me some time to speak. So my name is Louis Legrand, and this is my poster. It's entitled Angular Redshift Fluctuations and CMB Lensing. So I'll briefly introduce you to what it's about. So I'm talking about combination of probes. So as what said earlier this week, what we're inter interested in cosmology is to, uh, to look at the uh, density of matter. This is represented by the box in the middle. But what we can actually observe is not this uh, density, the fluctuation of density of matter. We can, for instance, observe the, thank you, Distribution of galaxies, so this is what uh, Euclid will achieve. Uh, but, uh, or for instance, we can use, for instance, the uh, CMB lensing. So we have the CMB in the background, and the light rays for the CMB have crossed all the structures in the middle, and have been, uh, the, the path has been distorted by the weak lensing effect. And by reconstructing this field, we can have a measure of the integral of the mass along the line of sight. So these two tracers are uh, not uh, going and are not giving the full information because the CMB lensing is like the integral of the mass, so you, you will not be able to see some redshift evolution. And galaxies, we know they are biased tracers of the mass. There is uh, like the correlation function of galaxies is not the same as the correlation function of the matter. So. So each of these probes has de degeneracies in the models, and also, as Elizabeth said, degeneracies in the systematics. And combining probes can break these degeneracies. And in a mathematical language, this equation is like a translation of this toy plot here in the left. We have the matter probe spectrum, the P of K, here in green. And each of the probes will have a different effect on this uh, matter probe spectrum, which with our observable being the, the angular probe spectrum, the C of L, between two probes, alpha and beta. So what I'm doing is to use uh, average redshift fluctuations. So this is a new formalism currently into development. And uh, this is similar to the galaxy over density fluctuations. But instead of measuring the fluctuations of the number density of galaxies in two different positions of the sky, we will measure the fluctuations in the average redshift of galaxies in two different regions of the sky. Uh, so this gives a field which is sensitive to the peculiar velocity of galaxies. And I do. Uh, Fisher analysis by combining this probe with uh, galaxy of density and the CMB lensing, and I use so, the autocorrelation and the cross correlations of all these fields. And this plot here shows the interest of uh, all these cross correlations by this, uh, this shows the marginalized errors on the dark energy equation of state. 
And uh, so we see that the angular redshift, the angular density fluctuation in blue, the angular redshift fluctuation in orange, and the combination of all these fields in purple. So we gain a lot of constraining power. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Salvati. I'm a postdoc at Institut d'Astrophysique Spatiale in Orsay. And today I'm going to present you a forecast analysis for constraints on cosmological parameters from Euclid galaxy clusters. So we have seen on Monday afternoon how galaxy clusters are a powerful cosmological probe. And we have to consider that with uh, ongoing and future survey, we will really improve the constraining power. So in particular, like for a Euclid-like survey, we are going to deal with like 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 detected galaxy clusters. So it means that uh, we are going to have such large statistics that all the accuracy on the uh, cosmological parameters will be dominated by systematic effects. So, uh, it means that it's really important to have a full characterization of all the different sources of systematics. Now, in practice, when we do cosmology with galaxy cluster, we often use this okay, number counts of galaxy clusters. And as we have already discussed on Monday, we put into the analysis different ingredients that can really uh, provide different sources of systematics. So in particular, we have the mass function in yellow that is really like the number of clusters at fixed redshift in a given mass bin. Then we have the scaling relations between the survey observable and the real mass of the, cl of the clusters. And then we have the selection function that is in some way related to the detection um, approach that we are uh, using in the survey. So what we did was to have, uh, was to uh, produce basically a forecast analysis based on MCMC approach in order to provide a more realistic estimation of all the uncertainties with respect to Fisher approach. And we decided to uh, use it for the Euclid mission, but this is really like a proof of concept that can be applied to any future galaxy cluster surveys. So in particular, we consider different models for the three different ingredients that we have seen at the beginning. And in particular, we consider different evaluation for the mass function and different precision in the uh, formulation for the selection function and the scaling relations. So we have considered the standard model of cosmology in order to uh, like build our baseline, basically. And then we have relaxed some assumptions. So in particular, we have considered the effect of massive neutrinos as different from the usual assumptions assumed value, and also we have relaxed the assumption of the cosmological constant. So considering a dark energy equation of state and different formulation for it. So if you want more details on the analysis, please come and see my posters later. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. So I'm here to introduce to you my work that it's presented in my poster in the next room. So I will give you, uh, let's say, an overview about the field and some basic concepts that I'm looking forward to discuss more around my poster. Uh, specifically, I'm a third year PhD student here in Yape. So let's start. So this is the context in which I'm working. The four, as people have already extensively explained, uh, we are trying to probe the late-time universe with the modern galaxy surveys. And we are interested in uh, forecasting the analysis that we, this survey will uh, perform. So in particular, when we probe the late-time universe, we have to deal with the non-Gaussian field, which is the matter field. And this is non-Gaussianity arises from the nonlinear evolution of the, um, of the matter clustering. In particular, I will probe this, uh, this distribution with the weak lensing, which is one of the two main probes of uh, Euclid. And Euclid actually is a great machine for weak lensing because it will allow to, probe to detect the shape of over a billion of galaxies over one third of the sky. And uh, these galaxies that are sources for weak lensing will be placed, uh, will be capable to detect the binnet position of these galaxies in 10 redshift bins. All this comes actually to leads to some statistical challenges that I uh, will discuss in detail in my poster. So first of all, we are dealing with the non-Gaussian field. So we had the two-point statistic, which is usually used. 
especially in Fourier space, so the power spectrum is not enough anymore. In particular, we'll analyze the information content in the cross-correlation between the mode via the weak lensing by spectrum. But as we know, the weak lensing by spectrum depends on triangular configuration, so when we've been in Fourier space, we have tons of possible configuration that translates in a lot of observable, and if we also consider that we can cross-correlate sources from different tomography ratios beams, this in particular leads to an overwhelming possible observable as estimated from the data. In fact, I will deal in my research with up to 10 to the power of 4 observable, and when we will want to build a likelihood, for example, for, for surveys like Euclid, we will have to find a way to light our codes. So I will, in particular, analyze possible, different possibilities for data compression, and in particular, via a possible remaining of the sources, I was capable to reduce the number of observables involved in my analysis, and also I perform a principal component analysis that allow to reduce even further the dimensionality of the problem. And if you have other question, I'm looking forward to discuss with you to my poster. Hello everyone, and thank you to the organizers. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge working with Anthony Chaloner and other collaborators listed here. And I'd like to tell you about some results that uh, we've been working on around uh, the de-lensing of CMB B modes. So as Anthony and others have already explained, uh, lensing gives you a B mode even if there was none from recombination. And it does so by essentially rotating uh, the, the E into B as shown here very schematically. And uh, at the power spectrum level, this gives rise to a large tail of white noise-like power comparable in amplitude to current experimental sensitivities and therefore constituting a major hurdle for searches of a primordial component from inflationary gravitational waves. Um, fortunately, um, this can be removed at least partially by mimicking the lensing operation in reverse, granted that we have an estimate of the, what the lensing potential looks like on the sky, that phi hat, and we've already learned this week that, among other techniques, that can be obtained internally from the non-Gaussianity of the lensed CMB, thanks to, for example, the quadratic estimators that Wayne Hu and collaborators pioneered. And um, the first project that I want to tell you about is a little result that will be uh, quite um, significant, well, that will become important in the next generation of CMB experiments for which the best uh, signal-to-noise reconstru reconstruction of the lensing potential will come from a quadratic estimator involving E and B fields. And the idea is that if you're trying to de-lens B modes using a uh, combination of E and B fields such that the B mode that you want to de-lens is also in the B field from which, from which you reconstruct, then the de-lens power spectrum will be biased low at that particular multiple. And this effect is interesting because it's not just that the amplitude is reduced, but that the variance of the D-lens power spectrum is also suppressed. And this is what got us interested in this problem, um, thinking that perhaps this could help you better constrain primordial B-modes. But, but Anthony and I actually found that the bias also couples to the primordial part, and in fact it always suppresses the signal by a larger fraction than the noise, such that you ultimately uh, end up losing information unless you mask those overlapping modes. And in this plot here, you can see 25,000 uh, simulated inferences of an input R of 0.01 for a Simons Observatory-like experiment. And uh, the takeaway message is that if you include the bias, uh, you model it right, uh, you get that green curve on the right, which is you're doing much worse than what an unbiased pipeline would give you, which is the red curve. And for this particular experiment, it's pretty much as if you hadn't de-lensed at all, which is what the overlapping curve, blue curve, would show you. So the conclusion is that you should mask those overlapping modes. And uh, the second thing that I would like to tell you about in my poster is current efforts to de-lens B modes happening at the Simons Observatory collaboration, of which I'm a member. And um, Simons will have a large aperture telescope that will be able to reconstruct uh, phi, the lensing potential, internally. But we will still benefit from combining that with external tracers uh, of the large-scale structure, which are known to correlate with CMB lensing, uh, such as the CIB or LSST. The idea being that these would help you get a handle on the small-scale lenses, which are important for de-lensing, but which uh, internal recon reconstruction cannot give you quite yet. Um, so here you can see how, we, how much of the lensing B mode we expect to remove from different combinations of traces. And if you put everything together, we hope to be able to remove up to 70% of the lensing B mode, which would uh, bring your error in R down by approximately a factor of two. 
Uh, but if you have any questions about the details of how we're doing this, please come talk to me and see my post. Thank you. Great. Thanks for all those speakers. We've got about an hour now to go and look at the posters and have coffee and back at 4.30.